Hey everybody, I'm Pastor Greg Heinch, and I'm excited to introduce this special three lesson series on life, money, and hope, taught by one of the best financial teachers of our day. He has written many uh, best selling books and is heard on over 400 radio stations around the world by millions of people, including here in Orlando, 3 p.m. every afternoon on 5.40 a.m. and 102.5 FM. He also has his own television talk show on Fox Business, but most importantly, he is a man of God. Please welcome Dave Ramsey. Wow. Wow. Well, thank you. That's cool. You guys are awesome. You're awesome. Well, I am so honored to be here. This is an incredible opportunity to get to share with you today and share with the folks all around the world through this process that Craig and his team has put together. It is an amazing thing to step back and see what God is doing all around the world. I get to travel a lot and see a lot of this kind of stuff, and it's, man, it's happening out there. You don't see it on the news. But it's happening out there. It's happening. And, and I get to travel to places like this and get to see people like you. And we're going to talk a little bit about money today. You know what I found out about money? Money's fun. <laughs> if you got some. <laughs> you know, and, and you know, the other thing I found out about money is most people, well, aren't doing real good. You know? I mean, if you've made big time mistakes with money, you know what that makes you? Over 12. <laughs> Most people have. How many of you ever done something stupid? Raise your hand. Yeah, man, I tell you, how many of you didn't raise your hand have a problem with lying? <laughs> I mean, it's a real deal out there. It's easy to fall over in this money thing. And the weird thing is we all think everybody else is the one that has got it together and we're the only stupid one. The devil has lied to us. He's told us this shame and guilt story about ourselves and, and made us believe it. When I went broke 20 years ago and lost everything and had to start completely over, I believed I was the only one that had ever done something that stupid, that completely out of control. And I, I did go broke. I've got a Ph.D. in D-U-M-B. <laughs> I am fully qualified to teach this stuff. I started with nothing and grew up not rich. How I many of you guys grew up not rich? I grew up not rich, and I, I, I remember graduating from college, broke, and married my beautiful wife, Sharon. We started off broke. We were eating off a card table, driving a 1902 Pinto. <laughs> now, you remember how you start out. You know what I'm talking about. We ain't got money, honey, but we got love. <laughs> and it's a good thing, too, because we ain't got no money. <laughs> and uh, I started buying and selling real estate. This was back in the 80s, 20 years ago. And I was pretty good at it. I'm kind of a math nerd, and I grew up in the real estate business. And by the time I was 26 years old, I had a little over a million dollars in real estate net worth, $4 million in real estate, making $250,000 a year. It was fun. We were having a blast. You know, sometimes I hear these people say, all those rich people are miserable. Uh-uh. Now, I'm not here to tell you money's going to make you happy, and I'm not here to tell you it makes you a good Christian or any of that kind of stuff. That's not my gig. It's not what I do. I don't have enough hair to teach that material. But the, uh, the truth is, that the, the thing is that, that I have found, though, is, is that as we made all of that money, it didn't fix our lives. It just made us more of who we already were. The moral of the story is if you get rich and you're a jerk, you just become a colossal jerk. If you get rich and you have a big heart, they call you a giver, and they give it a big, long name, a philanthropist. If you get rich, you become more of what you are as you build wealth. So be careful of what you are. We learned that on the way up, and we learned it on the way down. Because I borrowed too much money, and the bank got sold to another bank, and they called our notes. <laughs> Step up on this rug, and we will pull it. <laughs> and I went... Yes, that's me. <laughs> Young and stupid. And I did it. And they called our notes, not because we had done anything wrong, not because we'd done anything illegal or immoral. They freaked out. Bankers freak out sometimes. Have you all noticed? 
And um, we spent the next two and a half years of our life losing everything we owned. We were sued and foreclosed on, and finally, with a brand new baby and a toddler and a marriage hanging on by a thread, we were bankrupt. This stuff will mess with your marriage, won't it? Number one cause of divorce in North America today, money fights and money problems. Number one thing people fight about in their marriage is money. Well, we did. Sharon would have left, but she just didn't have the money. <laughs> I mean, we fought, baby. We didn't get a divorce. We held on to each other, but sometimes it was just to get a better grip. Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> She's from the hills of East Tennessee. Frying pan throwing there is an Olympic event. And we hit bottom. I was on one of these news stations. I do all this TV work these days. And one of these talking heads asked me the other day, so, 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 so you, you started with nothing and you became a millionaire and then you lost everything and now you're a multimillionaire. So how did you bounce back? I was like, dude, when you fall that far, you really don't bounce. It's more of a splat. I sat around and blamed everybody else. You ever blame everybody else when you do something stupid? It's kind of a problem in our culture today, you know. Turns out McDonald's does serve hot coffee. <laughs> so, you know, I, I sat there, and, and, and the weird thing was is I do everything backwards. I, I didn't grow up in church, and I met God on the way up. Most people meet him, you know, at the bottom of their mess, right? But I met him on the way up. I got to know him on the way down. It'll teach you. This thing called pain... It'll make you open a Bible. See, I've got all these letters and licenses and things after my name that says I'm supposed to know something about money. And there I sat, broke. No money. And then this guy told me the Bible had some stuff to say about money, and I went, really? Okay. I'll try that one. Mine didn't work. And I started studying people like Larry Burkett and Ron Blue and many of the other great writers in Christianity around the world that have opened the Scriptures for us on this subject and I discovered this really easy stuff. It's easy to understand, and it works every time, but it's really hard to do. Because biblical finance, like so many other things, personal finance, the, the attributes and things you need in your life to be able to win with money, well, it's about 80% behavior. It's only about 20% head knowledge. Most of you know what to do. You're just not doing it. You're like me. The problem with my money is this idiot I shave with. <laughs> the guy in my mirror is my issue. If I can get him to behave, he can be skinny and rich. <laughs> so the stuff we're going to talk about out of the Bible, it's not like hard to understand. It's devastatingly easy to understand. You're going to be going, oh, good, I had a V8. It really does work that way. It's pretty easy stuff. So, you know, we're going to write some of this down and we're going to think about it as we go. I want to cover five of the basics of biblical finance. Some of the first things I learned, and I still believe they're probably the most important things I've ever learned in my life about money, and I have learned a lot about money over the years. But this stuff, if you do these five things, it works every single time. It'll take some time. Now, if you're looking for easy, it's not going to work. We don't sell microwaves here. We sell crockpots. It's going to take a while. You've got to cook it a while, but it'll taste better. Have you noticed most things in your spiritual life are that way? They're not instantaneous. You don't get this, zzz, and all of a sudden you're a perfect husband. Didn't work that way. No, took 27 years and still not even close to the word perfect. I'm working on the P part still. But, you know, it's a process, isn't it? And this thing called money is the same exact thing. But to the extent you and your family will engage in these five activities, you will win with money. First thing you want to do if you want to win with money is you need to learn to get out of debt. Get out of debt. Now, that's pretty basic stuff. No kidding, Dave. That's a great idea. But, you know, the, the truth is debt equals risk. I have done detailed research, in-depth research, and I have found out that 100% of the foreclosures occur on homes with a mortgage. <laughs> debt equals risk. Risk. The way the Bible says that, it says the borrower is slave to the lender. You ever felt that way? 
Oh, I felt that way. I know what that feels like. It's called less than fun. You know, slaves don't have any options. They have to do what they're told. They put bumper stickers on their car that says, I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. <laughs> they're stuck. Slaves have to keep a job they hate because they've got to pay the bills. Slaves aren't really generous people either. It's hard for them to give. It's hard to give when you can't hardly just pay the bills that you owe. Got a lot of masters in your life. It's hard to serve two masters, Jesus said. You hearing the Bible ringing through this? It's there. It's hard to live like this. When all the money comes in and all the money goes out, and only the names are changed to protect the innocent. <laughs> your checkbook sounds like a wind tunnel. <laughs> Whew, straight through. <laughs> and one old boy he said, I just want direct deposit to the grocery store. It all goes over there anyway. <laughs> car payments. Fleeced your car. You got master card. Who named that anyway? You discovered bondage or American distress. <laughs> it's real, isn't it? It's real. People got a student loan that's been around so long they think it's a pet. <laughs> but what would it be like to have no payments? What would it be like to make the decision that I'm going to get completely out of debt? You know, I got rid of my credit cards after I went broke. Number one, they took them. But number two, I never went back and got them again. Because, you know, I got to talking to millionaires. And I've never, I've talked to thousands of millionaires in my life. I have never met a millionaire who said, Dave, you know, I made it all with my Discover points. <laughs> Those airline miles, that was my breakthrough financial moment. <laughs> I have never heard that. And yet I have met with hundreds of thousands of families who have been less than blessed by these things. To the point you could even say they were cursed. Well, you can use them responsibly. Well, yeah, you can use a lot of stuff responsibly. It's stupid. And that's your rationalization. I have debit cards. It's one on my business, one on my personal account. And it turns out they do everything your credit card will do except put you in debt. The only problem is you have to have the money. You can't buy stuff you don't have. We'll get to that in a minute. So we just said goodbye to Home Depot. See you later, J.C. Penney's. <laughs> buy Sears. We'll have to buy your tools at the flea market. Victoria's Secret. <laughs> they take cash. It's okay. It's okay. And so we went about the business of having plastic surgery. A plastectomy, if you will. And you know, the weird thing is, if you don't have any payments, breathe that in for just a second. What if you didn't have a car payment? You know, the average car payment in America today is $478 over 84 months. If you take $478 and invest that in a decent growth stock mutual fund from age 30 to age 70, you'll have $5.6 million. Hope you like the car. <laughs> You're trapped by buying stuff you don't need with money you don't have to impress people you don't really like. Because there you sit in that $600 car payment at the stoplight going, <laughs> just impress somebody you'll never meet. That cost you 1000 bucks just then. You got to make a decision how you're going to live. And I figured this out to be true. When we went broke, the borrower truly is slave to the lender. And I decided I wasn't going to live that way anymore. And I drew a line in the sand and I said, I'm done. Now, I got to tell you, it means you don't get to do some things that you really want to do. But it turns out if God wants you to do something, he'll send you the money. Shut up. <laughs> Quit your whining. Really, because that's what debt is. It's financial whining, isn't it? I want it. It's <laughs> exactly what it is. And then you use these sophisticated words and language and intellect to completely rationalize it, and it feels all good to you, and everybody looks at you as going, you are so stupid. You look good, but you are dumb. And that's what's going on. And it's going on all around the world right now. It turns out that this is not some ancient scripture. It's the truth. It's how things work. The second one is you need to act your wage. You need to learn to live on less than you make. You are not in Congress. <laughs> the Bible says it this way. It says a foolish man devours all he has. If you spend everything you make, according to Scripture, you're a fool. 
Now, don't get mad at me. God said it. But I've been there. I've been a fool. And you don't want to be a biblical fool. This is not a greeting like, hey, fool. Okay? This is like, this is uh, when you read about a biblical fool in Proverbs, uh-uh. This is somebody who hasn't got a chance. And you don't have a chance if you spend everything you make. You have to learn to live on less than you make. And you know, that leads you to the scripture that says godliness with contentment is great gain. You know, contentment is probably the most powerful financial principle there is. Because if you're okay with your car, if you're okay with your clothes, if you're okay with your house, if you're okay, suddenly you can just kind of calm down and the debt starts going away and the savings can come and the giving will happen and life starts flowing the way it's supposed to. But instead, we are in the feverish, feverish acquisition mode all around the world. Give me, give me, give me, give me. And we don't think we've got the gimmies. We don't feel like one of those four-year-old kids that we say, you had the gimmies. We don't say, say that to ourselves, but that's the way our culture has been acting and reacting. And I've done it too. I've done it with zeros on the end, so I'm not picking on anybody. I'm just saying it doesn't work because you're a fool. And fools don't prosper. So act your wage. It's the only chance you got. And, th and then we need to get on a budget. If you worked for a company called You Incorporated and you manage money for You Incorporated the way you manage money for You now, would you fire you? Don't answer that. <laughs> if your job was to manage money, I mean, it's amazing to me. People do stupid stuff and then they say, Lord, bless me. And God's going, uh uh. <laughs> no, I mean, if you read the parable of the talents, those that manage well get to do more. That's what it says. If you take care of the little things, you're, you're, you're trustworthy to others. I got 250 people working on my team right now. If I got somebody misbehaves in the little things, you think I promote them to run the whole deal? I mean, if you're working at Burger King and you do a great job, you know, they'll promote you from fries to whopper flopper, <laughs> right? And if you keep going and do a bad job, do you think you get to be regional manager? No, you get go back to the fries if you do a bad job. I've got a teenage son and and I've been teaching him to drive over the last many, many years. And he's been driving now for a couple of years. And we're doing, doing pretty good with it. And so far, no problems and lots of threats from Dad. But, um, you know, when he's 16 years old, you know what he is behind the wheel? Incompetent. Okay? The state will give him a license, but that doesn't make him competent. So you think I'm giving this boy a viper? You think he's getting a new Corvette and go from 0 to 60 in 3.2 seconds? No, he gets a 92 Chevette. You know? Give him something he can't hurt himself with because he's not competent. You know why? Because I'm a loving father. I'm only going to give him what he can handle and has shown competence to handle because if he's not competent to handle it, it won't be a blessing to him. Oh, he'd be excited to get a brand new Corvette. But that doesn't mean it'd be a blessing. He'd probably kill himself in it or somebody else worse, you know? And so, you know, your loving father is not going to give you stuff that will harm you. And if you can't handle a little bit of money, he's not going to give you a bunch of it. You'll look like you won the lotto and be bankrupt in five years. Get out of control with yourself. So, got to get on a plan. Jesus said it this way. He said, for which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost to see whether he has enough to finish it? Lest he get halfway up and is unable to finish. And all who see him began to mock him and say, this man began to build and was unable to finish. You better have a plan or you'll get halfway up and you'll be unable to finish. That's Jesus. Read it. Red letters. That's the man talking. Don't build it. You wouldn't build a house without a blueprint. If you hired a contractor to build a $4 million house and he laid out a paper bag on the front of the, his truck and said, we're just going to do it like this and started sketching. <laughs> You'd be going, uh-uh, no, 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 next. And that's exactly what God does. So in your working lifetime, you're going to handle four or five million dollars, six million dollars, ten million dollars. Act like it. Be responsible. Be an adult. On paper, on purpose, before the month begins, sit down, give every dollar a name, and agree on it with your spouse for those of you that are married. You got to do it. You won't win unless you do. The next one is you have to learn to save money. If you don't save money, you'll be broke your whole life. See, for years I was really good at earning money, but I wasn't good at handling money, so I tried to out-earn my stupidity. <laughs> yeah, that's happened to other people, I can tell. 
You can't out-earn your stupidity. You have to learn to save money. And we teach people to save money for three basic things. Number one, we teach them to save for an emergency fund. Now, Grandma said that. Grandma said to save for a rainy day, visual aid. You need to save for a rainy day. You know why? It's going to rain. Get ready. Money Magazine says 78% of you will have a major negative financial event in any given 10-year period of time in your life. Something's going to happen. The transmission's going to go out. A kid's going to get sick. Aunt Gertie's going to die, and we got a barrier. Something's going to come up. You're going to get laid off. The unexpected pregnancy, which has always kind of tickled me. <laughs> but here, you know, here, here's the deal. You better be ready. Life's coming. It's coming. And if you hadn't lived long enough for life to knock you over, I'm just here to warn you, I'm an old guy. It's going to knock you over. And it's kind of cool if life shows up and you have money. Because you know what this is? It's Murphy repellent. You know who Murphy is. If it can go wrong, it will. When you have an emergency fund of three to six months of expenses set aside, Murphy will leave you alone. He will visit your neighbors. <laughs> have you ever noticed that when you're broke is when everything goes wrong? Your life looks like a country song. But when you put $10,000 or fifteen dollars or $20,000, whatever, three to six months of expenses is, because that ought to be your emergency fund, between you and life, life says, hmm, that one's ready, I'll leave him alone. And he backs off in the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil. Wise people save choice food and oil. You're wise if you save. You're a fool if you devour all you have. You're getting the parallels here, the, the perpendiculars here. They're all here for you. God's just being real plain. He's telling you, kiddo, I love you, and this is your little instruction book. If you do it this way, it works. If you don't do it, it, it doesn't. Now, it's not a sin if you don't. Debt is not a sin. It's biblically stupid. <laughs> but it's not a salvation issue. It's your father going, mm, 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 mm. What am I going to do? That's one of my stupid kids. <laughs> you know? The second thing you need to save for other than emergencies is you need to save up and pay cash for things. If you pay cash for things, you know what happens? You spend less. If you take 10 or 15 Uncle Benjamin Franklin's $100 bills and put those in your pocket, you carry them around a little while, you become kind of attached to them. It's kind of like, Uncle Ben, it's part of the family, right? And then you just go, you get ready to spend something, you lay one of these things down, you have an ouchie moment. It's like, ah, I don't think I want that. Completely changes the whole equation. McDonald's did focus group studies, and they found with credit cards that you spend 47% more out of McDonald's than if you spend with cash. You know why? Because it hurts. You stand there with that plastic going, okay, supersize that, give me the apple pie, and I'll pay for his. <laughs> right? You walk up with this thing, you're like, uh, dollar menu, you're on your own. <laughs> Changes the whole perspective of things, doesn't it? When you spend this, you feel it. There's an emotional attachment to this. And Dun & Bradstreet did a study on other things that says you spend 12 to 18% less than when you spend with plastic. Buy with cash. Plus, you can kind of just go in the stereo store and walk around. <laughs> and they'll go, oh, well, can we help you? <laughs> yeah, I bet you get service, don't you? And then you go up to pay, and the little guy goes, whoa, dude, like this one's got real money. Uh, get the manager. I don't know how to ring this up. But you can get a deal doing this, can't you? It embarrasses my wife. She says, you embarrass me. Well, that's just a side benefit of the process. <laughs> and guess what? If you save money, you also learn to invest money. Do you know $100 a month invested in a decent growth stock mutual fund from age 30 to age 70 is $1,176,000? Pizza and cable money, and you can retire with dignity. For what we spend on lattes, you can avoid retiring and buying the cookbook 72 Ways to Prepare Alpo and Love It. <laughs> invest for your future. Invest for your kid's college. Invest. But you haven't any money to invest if you didn't have money for emergencies. And if you hadn't stayed out of debt. And if you're not on a plan. See how these things start to work together? 
If you start working a simple system like this and you really do it, it'll rock your world. It'll change everything and it'll allow you to do the last one. And that's give. Oh, this is the best thing you can do with money. This is the most fun there is with money. Now, you know, certainly you can tithe to your local church. That's the basics. We start there, right? But, I mean, you get a little bit of money, you can have some fun. Got a lady working on our team. And she, um, we give out profit-sharing bonuses. We share our profits. What a neat idea with the people that work for us. And, uh, and, and you know, her bonus every month, she's been with us a while, is three, four, five hundred bucks a month, depending on how good our profits are. She does pretty good at just on the bonus, you know. And she and her husband decided a few years ago, they're not rich people, but she, she, she decided that they were going to start a ministry. And, and what they do is they take their profit-sharing check and, and they cash it in cash and they go to the local Waffle House. And they pray before they go in that God will seat them at somebody's seat that waits on them that needs some help. She said the first time we did it, we went in there and the little lady was pregnant. And she's like, thank you, God. Because listen, if you're pregnant and you're working in Waffle House, you know what? You need a job. <laughs> this is somebody's working because they need to. You know? No, no, not picking on Waffle House or anything, but that's tough work, right? Can you imagine what happened when they left a $400 tip and went to the car? <laughs> How fun is that? Dave, thanks so much for sharing the profits with us. My husband and I are having so much fun. We decided, based on a suggestion of you last Thanksgiving, to create our Waffle House ministry. We take money from the profit sharing, set it aside, and then we pray for God to give us wisdom and, a, and place a person that needs the extra money as our waitress. Then we enjoy a fun meal, leave a big tip, and leave feeling giddy. The last waitress we had was very young and very pregnant, and as soon as she walked up to our table, I thought, wow, God, this is going to be so cool for her. Is that broke people can't do that? People that don't live on a plan and have a bunch of payments can't do that. People that don't save money can't do that. We've got forums on our website at My Total Money Makeover, and the people with the forums all, all write in and stuff. And one of the ladies wrote this in the other day. She sent this to us. Uh, she says, I bought my husband, who's a captain in Iraq right now, a 97 Mazda Miata. A 97 Mazda Miata. So when he comes home from Iraq, it'll be here. It has 108,000 miles on it. I paid $2,800 for it. Fully aware it needed repairs, and I had budgeted about $3,000 for the repairs. I posted a picture on the Total Money Makeover boards because it's our first cash car, and it's so not like the hoopties that we hear about. A couple days later, I received a FedEx envelope from a member of the TMO board. Inside was a heartfelt letter and a check for $1,000 to go towards the repairs. This was from someone who had gotten out of debt and was living on a plan. They were living like no one else, and now they were able to live like no one else. I can't begin to tell you the impact that had on me, having had a really hard year with my husband gone, and especially hard month this month. The gift wiped away so much pain and bitterness for a military wife. A thousand dollars. That's a big hit for a thousand bucks. I mean, there are people that drop a million dollars on something and don't get that much fun, or as much fun as 400 bucks on a waitress. Oh, my gosh. It'll change your world. It'll rock your world. But you can't do all of these things unless you do all of these things. You can't just get out of debt. You've got to save. You can't just save if you don't get out of debt. If you don't have a written plan, it's not going to work. It all weaves together, people. This is how it works. You know why? Because God's not concerned about your money. He doesn't care about your money. He cares about you. He's crazy about you. He's got a plan for you. And he's saying to you, my children... This is how you live. And if you'll live this way, you'll win. And, and what he's trying to do is he's trying to change the person in your mirror. He wants you to be a better person. Goodness gracious. He wants you to win at a level you've never won before. I mean, how many of us that have kids? I mean, we want good things for our kids. And if we be an evil, do that. How much more so our Father in heaven? Wow. He's got a game plan for your money. How whacked is that? And it works every single time without fail every time you work this it'll work does it work without any bumps in the road no being a servant doesn't work without any bumps in the road but it is the way to live your life right so there's bumps in the road get ready there's going to be people that make fun of you broke people will make fun of your plan which is always a good sign by the way if broke people are making fun of your financial plan, that's like fat people making fun of your exercise plan. <laughs> yeah. 
This is encouraging. So, so think this through. God has a game plan. Do these basic things over and over. Get out of debt. Act your wage. Live on a written plan. Learn to save because you're going to need it. And then most of all, become an awesome, out of control, abundant mentality giver. Oh, that's when the whole thing, that's when you know you hit it. That's when you know you hit the sweet spot and the ball's going out of the park. You can feel it then. I encourage you. It's not an easy trip, but it's a trip worth taking. God says to live like no one else so that later you get to live like no one else. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but it yields a harvest of righteousness. It works every time. If you pay a price to win, take these five things and go change your world. Lord, we thank you for the folks here today. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for your love to us. It, it gives us hope. And God, we need that. We need to know that you care about us. And, and we need to see that you've got a future for us, and you've got a plan for us. And it's a plan for hope. And Lord, just wrap your arms around everyone watching this and everyone in this room, and, and just breathe your love and your prosperity on them. In Jesus' name.